Hey guys, let's continue our adventure in the land of Mordo, where the shadows lie. Seriously, take a look at our current implementation of shadow mapping. The transition between light and shadow is too abrupt and it doesn't look like in the real world. So we have two methods today to make the shadow much softer. One is simple and the other one, well, not so simple. Let's get into it. The problem with our current shadow mapping technique is that each pixel that goes through the fragment shader is tested against a single pixel in the shadow map. This means that one pixel can be in shadow while its neighbor is in broad daylight. When doing this along the edge of an object, it creates the appearance of a very hard line between light and shadow. The solution in general is to extend the shadow test to the neighboring pixels and create a spectrum of shadow factors that soften the transition between light and shadow. The first method is called percentage closer filtering or PCF. The idea is to define a square of pixels around the current pixel. In the following example, we have a square of three by three and the current pixel in this case is exactly in the center. By the way, this square is called a filter. We go over each pixel in the filter and perform the exact same shadow test that we've been doing in the original implementation. This means sampling the depth of the corresponding pixel in the shadow map and comparing it to the depth of the current pixel. The result can be either 0 or 1. The final shadow factor is the average of all these intermediate results. This means that we can have 9 different shadow factors. 0, 1 and an additional 7 factors in between in steps of 1 over 9. This enables a much smoother transition. In the following example, the pixel in the center is actually in the light, but since there are three shadowed pixels in its filter, it means that the final shadow factor is actually 6 over 9, or 2 thirds instead of 1. Let's see how to implement it. Ok, so we are in the function called shadow factor in the fragment shader. We begin as usual by manually projecting the light space position, scaling by a half and adding a half, so that x, y and z are in the range of 0 to 1 instead of minus 1 to 1. This is basically a transformation from NDC to texture space. Now let's jump down to the loop below. We have a nested loop here where we go over the y, that's the rows of the filter, and then the x, that's the columns. In each loop we go from minus 1 to 1, so this is our 3 by 3 filter. In the body of the loop, we generate a vector, which will be used to offset the projected light space coordinates into the other pixels of the filter. Now let's uh, think about it for a second. The coordinates that are used to sample the shadow map are in the range of 0 to 1. We want to move these coordinates one texel to the left, right, top, bottom, and any combination of these directions. So we need the size of the texel in order to step inside the shadow map. This is very simple. We just need to divide the length of texture space, which is always 1, by the width and height of the shadow map. This will provide the size of the texel on the U and V axes, respectively. We can see this calculation up here. The dimensions of the shadow map are provided in these two uniforms. The texel width and height are packed together in a 2D vector. Back to the loop, we multiply a 2D vector, which is based on the current x and y, by the texel size vector. This gives us the offset vector, which is a combination of the positive or negative texel width and height, depending on our current position in the filter. The offset is added to the UV coordinates before sampling from the shadow map. The shadow test is the same as before, but the result is accumulated. We get the average of the intermediate shadow factors by dividing the sum of the shadow factors by the number of pixels in the filter, which is 9. The result is pretty nice, but when we get close to the edge of the shadow, we can clearly see the steps between light and shadow. So this is a hard-coded implementation of a 3x3 filter. Obviously, the larger the filter, the softer the shadow will become. Let's make the size of the filter configurable. I've added a uniform variable for the filter size. For simplicity, the filter is always a square. First, we calculate half of the filter size. We need to be careful because the filter size may be an odd number, 
in which case the current pixel is in the center, or an even number, in which case it will be one pixel away from the center. The loop now starts at minus half the filter size and goes to minus half the filter size plus the filter size. This nicely supports the two cases of odd and even filter sizes. We can now easily compare between several filter sizes. Don't go overboard with this since the larger the filter size, the more GPU cycles will be required to execute the fragment shader. Okay, so PCF has a couple of noticeable deficiencies. First, we are wasting a lot of sampling operations when the entire filter is either inside or outside the shadow. In fact, most of the pixels will fall into this category, especially with large shadows. In these cases, the final shadow factor is either 0 or 1, but we don't know that until we finish testing the entire filter. Second, when we get close to the shadow, we can see that the transition steps are quite noticeable. It would be nice to blur this a bit further. These two problems are addressed by the second method, soft shadow edges with random sampling. It is based on an article by Yuri Walski from GPU Gems 2, which is available for free from NVIDIA, and you can find the link in the video description below. The solution to the two problems is as follows. In PCF, the distance between the different sample points is one texel. We're going to replace that with randomly placed sample points. It's not going to be an entirely random pattern, because in many extreme cases, it will not provide a good coverage. Instead, we will divide the filter into a grid of cells, and each sample point will move to a random location within its own cell. However, this is not enough. Even a random pattern doesn't solve the visible transition problem if we use the same pattern for every pixel. The solution is to use different random patterns for neighboring pixels. Now here's the problem. GLSL doesn't provide an internal random function. Therefore, we're going to prepare a random pattern offline on the CPU before the program actually starts running and use it in our fragment shader. The pattern will be stored in its own texture, which will make it available to the fragment shader. Now, we could theoretically prepare a random pattern for every pixel in the frame buffer, but in practice it will be too much of an overhead. Therefore, we will create a small texture of random offsets and map each pixel in the frame buffer to this texture using a simple modulo operation. The random pattern will repeat itself whenever this texture wraps around, but neighboring pixels will still get a different filter. So this will hopefully solve the visibility problem with PCF. What about the sampling overhead? Turns out that people who have done the research on this topic came to the conclusion that it would be better to transform the square filter into a semicircle. This transformation is called warping. Warping transforms the grid into a set of rings. The overhead problem is solved by testing only the samples on the outer ring. If all of them are found to be either in shadow or non-shadow, we skip the remaining sample points and assume that the entire filter is the same. Obviously, it may not always be correct, but we assume that due to the randomness, the next pixel will pick up the error. When the sample points on the outer ring do not agree, we continue testing the entire filter and calculate the shadow factor the same way as in PCF. Okay, so much for the theory, now let's see how to implement this. As I said, we're going to use a small window for the random patterns, and for each element in that window, we will have its own random filter. This means that we actually have four dimensions here, the width and height of the window, and the width and height of the filter for each element in the window. To make it simpler, we will make both the window and the filter a square. In order to store the random filters, we will use a 3D texture, which is simply composed of multiple slices of 2D textures. We will access this texture as if it is a standard 3D array in C++. So instead of normalized UV coordinates, we will use regular integer indices X, Y, and Z. In this type of access, there is no interpolation of the result. The GPU will calculate the memory location and fetch the value from there. The Z index is used to select the slice, and then the X and Y access the specific element in that slice. 
Now we need to map four dimensions into three. So what we will do is to use the entire X axis for a single filter. This means that the width of the texture will be filter size squared, where filter size is the width and height of the filter. The width of the window will be mapped to the height of the texture. And finally, the height of the window will be mapped to the depth of the texture. I know it's a bit confusing, but hopefully this diagram helps in understanding it. Now here's another bit of complexity. In addition to setting the width, height and depth of the 3D texture, we need to tell OpenGL the type of each element. We're going to use GLRGBA32F, which means that in every element we can actually store two sample points. A sample point is a 2D vector, so we can have one sample point in RG and another in BA. So the width of the 3D texture can actually be half of filter size squared instead of filter size squared. I created a new class called Shadow Map Offset Texture in order to generate and store the 3D texture. The constructor takes the window size and the filter size. Now let's see how to populate this texture. We will create a vector for the sample points and arrange them as we discussed. The total number of sample points is window size squared times filter size squared. And since a sample point is a 2D vector, we also need to multiply by 2. Next we have a nested for loop where we scan the four dimensions, starting from the rows and columns of the window and followed by the rows and columns of the filter. Notice that the rows of the filter are actually traversed from the end back to zero. This will make sense in a minute. Let's see how to create a single filter using a 4x4 example. If we just plot the coordinates of the filter based on the two inner loops, we have this grid where every point is located at the bottom left corner of its cell. The first step is to move each point to the center by adding a half to both X and Y. Next, we want to apply a random jitter. We will use the STL library to generate a random floating point number in the range of negative half to positive half. This will keep each point in its own cell or at least on the border. Now we want to normalize the result so that it will be in the range of 0 to 1. The reason is that in the fragment shader we will actually multiply it by a radius and this will allow us to scale the circle up or down. Next comes warping and for that we use the following equation. We take the root of y multiplied by the cosine or sine of x multiplied by 2 times pi times x. This is why the rows of the filter are traversed backwards. Cosine and sine provide results in the range of minus 1 to 1, but the root of y serves as the distance from the center. By going backwards on y, we start on the outer edges and move inwards. The final result can now be stored into the vector, and since we are storing an entire filter along the width of the texture, we just need to increment the index by 2 to get to the next element. Now that we have the vector with all the sample points, we can create and populate the 3D texture. I'm using GL storage here instead of GL text image. In a nutshell, GL text storage functions create an immutable texture where only the contents of the texture can be changed, but not the dimensions or the type. We can see that we're using GL RGBA 32F as the format. The width of the texture is set to half of filter size squared. The height is the width of the window and the depth is the height of the window. Now let's jump to the fragment shader. This is a long piece of code, so let me just give you the highlights of this function. The window coordinates of the current pixel are provided in the system generated variable GL frag word. We do a modulo operation of both axes by the size of the offset texture in order to map the current pixel to one of the elements of the offset texture. We set the result into the Y and Z components of the offset chord vector, which will be used to fetch the offsets. We do a short for loop to test the outer ring of the filter. The creation of the texture was done by going backwards on the rows of the filter, so we have the outer ring at the start of the line. The running index is used as the X of offset chord. We use Texel fetch to get the offsets. This call simply fetches the element from the texture, which is located at the offset in the 3D vector. No interpolation or anything. The offsets were normalized before they were stored in the texture, 
So we can now scale them back by multiplying by the radius, which is another uniform that we can use to control the size of the filter. Texel fetch returns a 4D vector. R and G are used for one offset and B and A for another. These offsets are used the same as in PCF. After we finish testing the first few sample points, we check whether the average of the intermediate shadow factors is 0 or 1. If it is, then that is the end of this function. If it is something in between, we continue checking the rest of the filter in exactly the same way. I hope you found this tutorial useful. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.